Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Today, insha'Allah ta'ala, we're going to be doing a chapter and probably from the most important of chapters. Because this particular chapter we're looking at today, bi'idnillahi ta'ala, is connected to akhir umur al Muslim fi hayati dunya. It's connected to the last affair of the Muslim in the life of this world. Because all the different topics and the different chapters we've been looking at so far is connected to the affair of the Muslim in the life of this world. Whether it's salah, whether it's anything connected to salah or other acts of ibadah, it's what connected to the life of this world. What we're looking at today, bi'idnillahi ta'ala, is Kitabul Janaiz, the book of Al Janaiz. And it's a chapter that reminds us of something we need to be reminded of every single day. In fact, every single moment of our life. As Ali radiallahu anhu used to say, أَكْثِرُوا مِنْ ذِكْرِ هَذِ مِنْ لَذَّاتِ Increase much in the destroyer of all pleasures. And the destroyer of all pleasures is al maut death. So this particular chapter, بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى will serve as a reminder to us of something we need to be reminded of regularly, and that is death. Death is such an important reminder that even if we don't want to be reminded of it, there are things that naturally happen to us on a daily basis that reminds us of death. And what are those things that happen to us on a daily basis that reminds us of death? Sleep, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, هُوَ الَّذِي يَتَوَفَّاكُمْ بِاللَّيْلِ Allah is the one that takes your soul during the night. So sleep is a form of minor death. And that's why Luqman alayhi salam said to his son, إِن كُنْتَ تَشُكُّ فِي الْمَوْتْ فَلَا تَنَمْ وَإِن كُنْتَ تَشُكُّ فِي الْبَعْثِ فَلَا تَسْتَيْقِذ If you have any doubts concerning death, do not sleep. And if you have any doubts concerning يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَ You'll be resurrected, do not wake up. And that's why the dua we make when we're going to sleep is what? Bismik Allahumma amutu wa ahya. O oh Allah, in your name, amutu, I die. So this act, this thing we go to on a daily basis, sleep, it reminds us of death. This topic of al-janah is, is a remembrance of something which is yaqini. Many things in the dunya is not certain. Not certain. But one thing which is certain, like the shari, it said, al-mawtu ka'sun, that death is a cup or a glass that every single person is going to drink from that cup or that glass. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kullu nafsin Every single soul should taste death. And as the Sha'ir also says, Al Kullu Nasi That death is a door that every single person is going to pass through this door. يا ليت شعري بعد الموت مدار جنات خلد إن عملت صالحا and he went on to say after passing through this door what is the abode where are we going to rest he said جنات خلد إن عملت صالحا a paradise of eternal abode if you do righteous action وإن خلفت فالدار هي النار and if you go against the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the abode is the hellfire so death, although we remind ourselves of it, is not the greatest musibah, the greatest calamity. Even though Allah Ta'ala calls it musibah, وَإِذَا أَصَابَتْكُمْ مُصِيبَةُ الْمَوْتِ And when you're overcome by the calamity of death. But the greatest musibah is how we end up after death. That is the greatest musibah. That would a person die upon the ta'ah, the obedience of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. Would he die upon seeking Mardatillah, the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it will be of those that the angels that descend upon during his death. And when we're doing this class of fiqh about funerals and death, one of the things we're going to look at, bi'idnillahi ta'ala, is how you behave or you treat the person that's passing away. And one of the things you're supposed to do for him is to make him say the shahada. Because at that very moment, a person is overcome by severe fear. Fear of the unknown. And also overcome by what? Extreme sadness of what they're going to leave behind. So you're supposed to help them to say the shahada. To say the shahada of la ilaha illallah. But from the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised, يُثَبِّتُ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِالْقَوْلِ الثَّابِتِ At this point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will keep those who believe firm at this point, بِالْقَوْلِ الثَّابِتِ And قَوْلُ الثَّابِتِ, the strong word or the firm word is لا إله إلا الله So from the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when a person is passing away, is that Allah ta'ala causes angels to descend upon this person, upon the believer. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا Those who say our Lord is Allah, but they don't only say our Lord is Allah, ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا They're consistent and they're upright. تَتَنَزَّلُ عَلَيْهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ The angels will descend upon them. And the point of dissension here is the point of death. That the angels would descend upon them when they have that severe fear and severe sadness and extreme sadness. Have no fear of what you're about to face. Have no fear or no sorrow of that which you're leaving behind. But rather have glad tidings of the paradise which you've been promised. So this is the joy or maybe the musibah that will be of those that when the angel of death comes to us, that the soul would disappear and try to hide in the body. And therefore, the angels have to violently drag out the soul. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, That those angels that drag out the soul severely with violence, with naz'a, because the, the soul, it wants to hide from the angels of death. So this is the real musibah. This is the real trial. This is the real tribulation of death, of al maut so this chapter, Kitab al is is a reminder for us all, bi-ibnillahi ta'ala, about the reality of death. And one way for us to face this reality of death is first and foremost to fear death by doing righteous actions. That we should fear death by doing righteous actions. Because if you look at the statements of the Salaf, rahimahullahu azza wa jal, when it came to the fear of death, they used to say that Concerning death and the fear of death. One of the Salaf, Rahimullah Azza wa Jal, he said about death and the pangs and the sorrows of death. That, Law Anna Sha'ara Alam al Mayit Waka'at ala Hayyin La Mata Min Shiddati al Alam. That the one that's going through the pangs of death, the sorrow of death at that moment. If a piece of his hair, one hair of his, that's going through that pain, it fell upon a person who was alive, the one who was alive would die immediately from the severe pain. And they used to say, that shiddatul mawt, the severeness of death and the pain of death, ashaddu min adorbi saif, is more severe than being struck with a sword. When nashru bin manashir, and to be caught by a sword, and some of them used to say that it's more severe mean to be struck by the sword 300 times. So to fear for this death by preparing for the death. And one of the preparation for death and the best preparation for death is what? Al-A'mal Saliha, righteous actions. And from the best of actions is Al-Ilmu, to seek knowledge. Because one of the things that keep a person firm upon La ilaha illallah is ilm. Because we know La ilaha illallah is the key to Jannah. There's not a key except it has teeth, a cup. And one of the conditions is in. Another preparation for this death is to learn the rules and regulations concerning death. For all those brothers who've been for Hajj and Umrah, your first hand of Hajj and Umrah, or the first time you ever prayed for those of us who were not praying before, it was quite confusing and quite difficult if you never practiced those regulations before. So do not think death will come to you, not prepared and look to the rules and regulations, you know what to do at that moment automatically. Just like when you go for Hajj or Umrah the first time, it's confusing, you don't even feel the spirituality of it. So one of the ways to prepare for that death is to learn the rules and regulations concerning al Jannah is funeral. So the Mu'allif, rahimahullah ta'ala, it begins with Kitabul Jannah is, and it's always due in a book of fiqh or in a class of fiqh, we always begin with what? Define nin every single thing. So it begins with Kitabul Janaiz, the book of Al Janaiz. And Janaiz is Jam'u Janaza. Janaiz is the plural of Janaza o Jinaza. So they call it Janaza o Jinaza. They say Janaza 
هو الميت عن السرير The janaza is the dead person on his bed والجنازه سرير للميت And janaza is the bed upon which the dead person is placed upon But the linguistics here doesn't concern us as much as the word ahkam, the rules and regulation of janaza. So the mu'allif rahimahullah ta'ala, before begin, he said, يستحب عند إحضرات الميت That it is preferred, it's mustahab, when you attend a person who's about to pass away. That توجيهه إلى القبلة To, to turn him towards the, the قبلة, the direction of the قبلة. But before this, there's something else which you mentioned earlier, which is preferred, which is talqeen, to make him say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. This shahada. If you attend a person and you know, you fear, or you feel that death is coming to him, is to do talqeen. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said in the hadith, Laqinu mawtaakum ash-shahada. Or La ilaha illallah. Cause those who you know they're about to pass away to say, La ilaha illallah. And it suffices to cause him to say it once. It doesn't have to be repeated. And it has to be done very gently. Because at that moment, that person is facing fear, sorrow. So you do it gently. Say, Ya Abdullah, O servant of Allah, say, La ilaha illallah. Once he says it once, it suffices. However, if he says, La ilaha illallah, and then after that, he goes into other speech, you can make him repeat it again. Why? Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, من كان آخر كلامه من الدنيا لا إله إلا الله دخل الجنة. Whoever's last word in this dunya is لا إله إلا الله enter Jannah. So if he goes into other conversations and says other things, you could repeat it again to make him say لا إله إلا الله. So first is تلقين. Secondly, to turn him towards the قبلة, if it's possible to do so. And likewise, it is preferred. From the thing which is preferred at that moment is a dua. Because the Prophet said, when a person's passing away and the angels are removing their soul, any dua that is made at that time, and malaika to aminu. The angels they'll be saying Ameen, Ameen to all the dua. So at that moment, a person should pray for mercy for this person who's passing away and for themselves. And forgiveness for him, forgiveness from themselves. And for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give him husnul khatima. So at this moment as well from the things that is preferred is a dua To make dua for the person who is passing away. Min al-mustahabbat kathalika. From the things which is preferred or which is recommended from the sunnah. Also, as we mentioned, is to turn him towards the where? The qibla. A dua And what else? Talqeen, to say la ilaha illallah. These three things they preferred. After this, the mu'allif rahimahullah ta'ala, after mentioning what is preferred, starts to mention the etiquettes and the ahkam, the rules and regulations concerning the person, not when he is dying, but rather when he is deceased, when he has passed away. What you should do from etiquettes. From the first of those etiquettes, he mentioned is, إذا تيقنا موته أغمدت عينا when it is certain that the person has passed away, his eyes should be closed. And closing of the eyes of a person who is deceased is based on actions and statements of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said a hadith, إِذَا حَضَرَ مَوْتَاكُمْ That when the ones amongst you or your deceased are passing away, فَأَغْمِدُوا الْبَصَرِ فَإِنَّ الْبَصَرَ يَتْبَعُ الرُّوحِ When they're passing away, or they've passed away rather, close the eyes. For the eyes, it follows the soul as it's passing away. So he said, from the things which is preferred is to close the eyes. So it's the statement of the Prophet ﷺ. However, this hadith is da'if. But we also have an action of the Prophet ﷺ. When Abu Salama radiallahu ta'ala an, when he passed away, the Prophet ﷺ, he closed his eyes. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Inna ruh idha qubida. That when the soul is taken tabi'ahu al-basar. That the eyes, it follows it as it's been taken away. And also from the things which is preferred, or which is from the etiquettes when a person's passed away, he said, Wa shudda lahya. That is lahya. They refer to this part of the, of the face or the jaw as a lahya. 
So example, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man hafidha ma bayna lahiyayhi. Whoever protects us between his two lahiyya, meaning his lips, and his private part will enter Jannah. So what is meant here is what? His jaw. That his jaw should be tied or clasped or clamped either with a rope or with a what? With a bandage. That's if the person that passes away, when he passes away, the mouth remains wide open. And this is from the etiquette and honoring the dead person, like closing of the eyes. You see one die and the eyes are up like this. It's a very frightening thing. And it doesn't look very nice, so you close it. Likewise, the mouth. Because when a person passes away, the first thing is, all the limbs and the joint become extremely flexible. They lose control. The muscles break down completely. Even the bridge of the nose, it breaks down to a point that when someone passes away, you find the nose, it leans towards one side. And that's why the ulama, they say, min alamatil mawt. From the signs, if you come across, across somebody, that from the signs that they've passed away, maylan arnabul anf, is the leaning of the bridge of the nose, when it's leaned to one side. And from the second signs is when the two saq, the two shins, they become twisted together, or joined together, or clasped together. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, wal tafatu saq bis saq. That when the two legs, they become wound together like this. So whenever you see these two signs, the nose is leaned. And the, the, the shins or the legs have become clasped or twisted together. Be sure that this person has passed away. So you're supposed to tie the jaw up or close it with a bandage or with a rope. Because the angels of death, when they take the soul, they begin from the feet. And then it goes towards the, the sack and then towards the thigh, then the stomach, then the sadr, the chest, until it reaches the what? The throat. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kalla idha balagati al That when it reaches the throat, the soul, and once it reaches the throat, everything from the ruh is gathered in the head, and then it comes out of the mouth. So the person's mouth stays open. And the last thing to be taken is his basar. So as the soul is coming out of his mouth, he's watching it with his eyes. So his mouth stays open and he's just watching it with his eyes coming out of his body. So from the etiquette is that after this, he should clasp or close this person's jaw. After that, he said, وَجُعِلَ عَلَى بَطْنِهِ مِرْآ And a mir'a should be placed, literally it means a mirror, but it means a rock or a metal which is very shiny that you could see your own reflection in it. But any metal could be used. A mir'ah should be placed upon his stomach. Because when a person passes away, there's gas and chemical reactions that happens within his stomach that causes the belly to what? To start to swell. So a something heavy, a heavy object should be placed on the person's stomach. Now this placing of a heavy object on a person's stomach, in the past, when people passed away, usually they pass away at home. But if they pass away in the hospital, you notice they don't place anything heavy upon the stomach. And yet the, the body or the stomach doesn't swell. Why? They place him in a fridge. So if he's placed in a fridge and or freezer and his body or his stomach is not swelling, there's no need to do it. So most times nowadays, they don't place anything on the, on the stomach. But in the past, the person passed away at home, they place something heavy on the stomach. Then he went on to say, that some scholars are of the opinion that you do not need to place anything upon the stomach. Because in most cases, even if you place something on the stomach and the body has started now to become like that, there's nothing you do, it will swell anyway. Jayid? Likewise, from the etiquette, before placing something on the stomach, forgive me, is that initially, as we mentioned, all the mafasil become very flexible. But then what happens after that? They become what? stiff. So if you come a person that's passed away, the first thing you should do is to try, first you close the eyes, if the mouth are open, you shut it, or tie it with a rope or bandage, is that the limbs immediately straighten out the limbs. The first thing, straighten out the limbs, but softly and gently. So you leave their arms by their side and you straighten out their legs. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَالْتَفَّةُ سَاقْ بِسَاقْ Because the legs at that point, they become twisted. Now in some cases, may Allah Ta'ala protect and preserve us, people pass away in car accidents and their bodies are twisted. Some people cut out of those cars. Jayid, in those cases, likewise, immediately as soon as possible, straighten out the limbs. Because when 
it's become solid and what they call, what's the terminology? Is it rigor mortis has set in? Sometimes you go to funeral parlors and you're going to do tarsil al mayyit, which we're going to do next week in the light ta'ala. If the brothers could arrange it, we're going to bring a table here and we'll go through it from the beginning to the end how it should be done. Because none of us know we'll be in that situation to wash a dead body. It could be a body of one of our children. So the children or the youth there don't think, you know what, I'm going to wash my father's body. You may, your father may wash your body. Because nobody knows when they're going to die, but you know you're going to die. How many funerals have I attended for youth and even babies that some ahkams, rules and regulations, you never thought you need to know them. For example, the child that passes away immediately after birth or just before birth, that it is a human being that from the ahkam, you should bring a plank of wood to place it on. Because all his body, his bones, they're not set. I remember one day after Salatul Isha, I mean, a man came in, in Egypt, and I was only meeting the masjid. Just like I arrived for Isha later, I arrived for Isha late that particular day. It was just me and another person in the masjid. And this man came in, running in, with a plank of wood, and tied to it was a white piece of cloth. And I looked. It was this baby that just passed away. And we had to pray janazah in the masjid. So it's something I saw live. So likewise, you don't know, it could be your wife that passes away. And it is preferred that a person washes his own wife or his father. Jayid, so we're going to go through this bi'idni lai ta'ala, how to wash the person, which part of the body, or how to cut the hair, how to apply perfume, how to push the stomach to cause everything to come out, how to avoid looking at the aura, the private parts, you know, because you cover it with a cloth. We'll go through this bi'idni lai ta'ala next week. So if someone passed away in an accident, for example, straighten out the limbs, because sometimes you go to funeral parlors and they're washing a dead person, and in trying to straighten it out, they do break bones. Because it's set in already, it's too late. They start to break the bones. Because if someone dies in an accident, that happens. I've had relatives, rahimahullah ta'ala, one of our relatives, passed away in such an accident, you know, that almost his lower half was gone completely, you know? And this is a message as well to all of us to be careful on those roads. And whatever sabab Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cause and reasons and protection Allah has given us to utilize them. There's no such thing as tawakkul vatan your camels. I see many brothers that is not from the law of Allah Azza wa to wear a seatbelt. Please wear a seatbelt and drive carefully. And do not drive recklessly. I find it surprising people mostly drive so recklessly. As though they do not value their life. If you die in that state, some of the ulama say if you go over a certain mileage hour or speedometer they say the hukum the ruling is the ruling of the one who killed himself and the one that killed himself to stabbing himself he'll be stabbing himself in the hellfire forever the one that killed himself by jumping out of the will be jumping off something into the jahannam so the one that dies crashing and he dies in that state imagine his state in the jahannam and even worse if you kill somebody how would you ever live with yourself how would you live with yourself and from the greatest masa'ib, trials and tribulations, where many people have passed away nowadays, the last thing they saw, the last flash they saw, was what? WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook. And it just, it just takes one second, bang, bang, you're gone. And you killed somebody because you're on your mobile phone. So, the mu'allif, rahimahullah ta'ala, then goes in, taqseel al mayyit how to wash the dead person. So he says, Bab ghaslul mayyit, the chapter of washing the dead person. So you begin, ghasluhu sutirat awratuhu. You begin, begin by covering all his prior parts. Next week, bi'idhna Allah ta'ala, we'll go into this bi'idhna Allah ta'ala. So we end the air with, Babul is the chapter of al is of funeral rites. Not funeral, but funeral rites beginning from when the person is passing away. So the first thing is talqeen, to make him say the shahada, but only when he's dying, not after he's dying. Because you go to many Muslim countries now, the person's in his grave already, and he's there, the imam is there. الملك, when the angel comes to you, say, La ilaha illallah. It's a bid'ah. Or the hadith of the Prophet in Surah in Abu Dawood, we say, Iqra ala mawtakum surah yaseen. Read upon your dying, surah yaseen. But this hadith is da'if. But even if it was to be sahih, it's to read upon the person who's passing away. Nowadays, it's become like a norm. Someone's passed away, yasin, 
Every funeral is Yasin. It's not Sunnah. Secondly, what should you do after Talqeed? If the person's mouth is open, close it. If you arrive when the eyes are open, to close the eyes. And this is all out of honoring the dead person. You see this honoring the dead person, that the Muslim is honored and respected, alive or dead, from creaming, perfuming his body, for example, washing his body, for example, and so on and so forth, so that he meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the best of sake. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all husn khatimah, a good ending, and cause of those to benefit from this reminder of death. Because like they say, وَكَفَ بِالْمَوْتْ مُوْعِذَةً Death is enough of an admonition. And every day people are passing away. Every minute, every second. But yet, we run away from this topic. From this topic. Nobody wants to be reminded of it. Even though we know, إِنَّ الْمَوْتَ الَّذِي تَفِرُّونَ مِنْهُ فَإِنَّهُ مُلَاقِيكُمْ That that death you run away from is going to meet you anyway. So it's better to face it. You know, and this is the sifum, the attributes of a Muslim, a believer in Allah Azza wa Jal. You know, that you know and you believe in this death and you prepare for this death and prepare our children from this death. And one of the things that's also preferred when you're doing the talqeen in terms of preparation of death, if someone is passing away, try to bring either students of knowledge or scholars to that person. Why? At that moment, there's a lot of rules and regulation. Is it wasiyah? Is it irt? Many people have not written their wills. They've not written their inheritance to bring a person of knowledge. Because that talqeen he wants to say, or that la ilaha illallah which he wants to say, is based on knowledge. That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Shahid Allah and la ilaha illahu. That bears witness, there's nobody that deserves to be worshipped but him. Wal malaika, and angels bear witness to this. What else? Wa ulul ilm, and the people of knowledge bear witness to this. And this, not, and this la ilaha illallah is based on what? Knowledge. Fa'lam. Allah ta'ala said, no. There's no deity worthy of worship but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, when they became extremely ill, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would visit them. Like Sa'ad ibn Abu Waqas, when he became so ill, he believed he was going to pass away. So he said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I'm going to pass. But he didn't pass from that, from that. He said, I'm going to pass. So therefore, I want you to advise me, advise me. I have daughters, lots of daughters, no sons, and I have a lot of money, inheritance. What should I do with my inheritance? I want to leave it all as a wasiyah. I want to will it all in charity. And the Prophet said, no, it's not good to do that. It's better to leave your children off wealthy, self-sufficient, than begging people. So Sa'id ibn Waqqas radiallahu anh then said, okay. After much, con much convincing, he said, I'll leave a thuluth, a third. So the wasiyah, which many people follow nowadays, they will a third of their wealth. So a third of their wealth, is it sunnah? Is it preferred? La. It is disliked. Because in the end of the hadith, the Prophet said, وَالثُلُثُ وَالثُلُثُ كثير. And a third of your wealth is too much. So it's makroh. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq is to, as a wasiyah, he gave a fifth. He said, أَرْضَ بِمَا رَضِيَ اللَّهُ بِهِ I am pleased with that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with. And when it comes to the ghanima, the booty, what does Allah ask you for? A fifth. So wasiyah, which is preferred, is what? A fifth and not a third. And a lot of these rules of regulation, many Muslims are aware of, even wills and inheritance, that after the person has passed away, and you know, it wasn't visible by people with knowledge, especially at wealth, you see the madness that happens amongst the children. Disagreement, fights, magic, some people hits on each other, lawyers, courts. And maybe the person is getting the punishment for all of this because he didn't prepare for this before he passed away. You know, you leave all these things behind, make sure you have a will, make sure you have inheritance. And even if, and in some cases permissible, we're going to go through it, you're going to give one particular child more than the other, know that it's permissible sometimes. If Allah has tested you with a child who's mentally challenged or differently abled, I don't like to say disabled, or is autistic, for example, it is permissible to leave more to that child with the permission of the others. Like, look, your brother, throughout the rest of his life, is going to need care, he's going to need this and that, I'm going to will most of my money to your brother. Jayid, so these rules and regulation, barakallahu feekum, they're important. If they allow us next week, inshallah ta'ala, we'll get a, a table here, a strong enough table, mashallah, because I think we're 100 or something, mashallah. Huh? A plastic table. And a brother and a kafan, how to do the kafan, how to tie them also. So, barakallahu feekum, subhanakallahu feekum. Now, and from the latest forms of bid'ah, of innovation, is eulogy. You know eulogy? 
the speech at the grave. Many people are doing this. They call it reminders. There's no such thing that at the grave, I've seen many videos that are hits now on YouTube. And many du'a, they do this eulogy at the grave, our brother, subhanAllah, da, 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 this reminder at the grave. It's not from the sunnah. That from the rights of your brother upon you is to visit him when he's ill. Because at that moment is when he's the most vulnerable. And when I went for the janazah, you will not believe, subhanAllah, yani, the, we have that much Westerners here. There's very few. Very few people turn out because people are busy in dunya. And maybe some people didn't even know. On top of that, I'd gone for a funeral day before that. The person that done the janazah gave a reminder, talked and talked and talked. But for this brother, mashallah ta'ala, the brother just reminded everybody what to do. Those of you not praying the janazah, you could pray now. So there's nothing wrong with saying that. Oh, at the moment, make dua for your brother. The sunnah, when he's being put into the grave. Bismillah ala sunnati rasulillah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to say to the sahaba radiallahu anhum, Is'alu li'akhiyikum al-thabaat fa innahu yus'alu al-an. Ask the bath for your brother. For he's being asked right now. So when he's being put there, Allah thabbitu, Allah thabbitu, Allah maghfir lahu. Such a thing is not bad, but the eulogy of, oh, brother Bilal, masha'Allah, da 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 These are the latest affairs that we have that are not permissible. So, barakallahu feek. Hmm. I mean, it's not permissible to delay the burying of the body. You know, we have to put sentiments aside there. I, was, I want to be buried in a Muslim country. I want to be buried back in Nigeria or Pakistan. You know, you should just bury the body as soon as you could bury it. It's not permissible to actually delay it. The only case is whereby you could delay it if there's, the death is doubtful. That, for example, they want to perform, not what they call it again, autopsy. Yeah, but autopsy, I mean, in most cases, someone dies unexpectedly. They always do that in the UK. You're forced to, even if you want to bury the body immediately. Uh, but in most cases, we know people could just die. People just drop, drop dead and just die. So we don't do it. However, if you're suspicious that the person may have been killed, may have been poisoned, at that point, with such excuses, it is actually permissible to delay it. But if there's no reason, no, it shouldn't be delayed. Barakallahu feekum. Next week, inshallah ta'ala.